What's going on? This is Chris Van Vliet, and you're watching Hawaii's number one podcast, the Casanova Podcast. The Casanova Podcast, the number one podcast in Hawaii, is brought to you by these contributors on Patreon. If you'd like to see more content like this more often, as well as more podcasts, reviews, impressions, early access releases, live streams, and original content, then consider becoming a patron today. and welcome back to another episode of Hawaii's number one podcast, The Casanova Podcast. I'm your host, Mikhail Casanova, coming at you with another phenomenal interview. And in today's episode, I have the privilege and honor of having one of my really, really good friends, my brother, and my podcasting guru, well, sensei rather, <laughs> the one and only Delvin Cox of The Delvin Cox Experience, which if you haven't heard The Delvin Cox Experience podcast, then you're missing out on true greatness because this is seriously one of the greatest podcasts I have ever listened to and had the luxury of being on before. And with that being said, if you haven't already, make sure you go and sub and follow and like and do everything you need to do. You know all the social media norms that you need to do. Follow. Make sure you're following and supporting Delvin Cox and the Delvin Cox experience because, like I said, it's truly one of a kind. Then, with that being out of the way, if you're ready to do it, I'm ready to do it. Let's go ahead and dive right into this episode. All right, and welcome everybody to another episode of Hawaii's number one podcast, the Casanova Podcast. I'm your host, Mikhail Casanova, and I finally, finally, finally got my bro on the podcast, my bro Delvin Cox of the Delvin Cox Experience, one of the hottest <laughs> podcasts that you guys, I'm, I'm commanding you guys right now to go and listen to it. It's on all podcasts and outlets. The man's phenomenal. Delvin, introduce yourself. I ain't doing that. <laughs> What's up, brother? How you doing, Mikael, man? I'm the host of the Delvin Cox Experience podcast, which each week I'm on a one-man mission to not a coach to university. My boy Mikael, me and him, good friends to say the least, man. That's my brother. Anytime he needs me, I'm there. Anytime I need him, he's there. You know, that's how we roll, man. That's the best exactly. way to describe that. Man, it, it's so funny. Like, I, I don't think people know how we, we even came to meet last year. It was uh through uh Mike Coulter, right? Yes, that is correct. <laughs> <laughs> so because so of Luke Cage, that's how we, we got to know each other. And it's like, man, it, it, it's something. We're on two opposite sides of the country literally, literally. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh yeah man go ahead and tell people about you tell them about your show uh where they can find you with your social media links and let's just go ahead and get into it well you already said most of it you know my podcast is basically uh <laughs> kind of like it's kind of like the casanova cast in terms of it's, it has different people on mm -hmm. and just interview people but mine is about diversity so one week we can have on anybody from any place. You know, Mikael gets the big guest. <laughs> I, I, I literally get anybody from any place and we have conversations. And it's about learning about people and their yeah. habits and what makes them tick. And that's what I think is cool about my podcast because you never know who's going to come on. You never know what they're going to say. And sometimes they get, we take it to real interesting places where you necessarily wouldn't think it go. Man, I... See, and I envy that because that, that's something I want to get back into doing is just like just having people on because I got into this part point now. And like, I mean, you know, like I kind of fell into like the voice actors and having these players, you know, pro players and whatnot. I kind of fell into it. I'm like, hey, you know, I'll reach out on Twitter and see if you're interested. Oh, oh, oh shit. OK, you actually do want to come on the show. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, Which is I, pretty cool. I, it it do the thing I miss is the spontaneity of people not knowing who's coming on because it's at this point now like if I get a 
somebody with like brand recognition or name recognition, it's the thing I get the most from people is like, oh, when is this person coming on? I'm like, oh, probably later on in the year. Oh, well, I'll watch then or I'll listen then. I'm like, why can't you listen now? Oh, because I don't know who that is. Well, why don't you expand your fucking horizon no. <laughs> and learn about somebody else? Like, uh, it's, it's Yeah, you know, it's funny you say that because a lot of times the episode that people don't expect to be good on my podcast, they come back up. Because that's the thing about my podcast. Mm-hmm. The first episode, the first time, like the first when it comes out, it'll do okay. Mm-hmm. But then the next week, that episode will blow up. up. Right. And yeah. <laughs> and then so I, I like by the end of the month, I have an episode like well, four episodes just blowing up with everybody listening to them because people are getting back, get back to them. Like, whoa, I didn't expect that episode to be good. It was incredible because you never know what the people are going to say. Like, for example, I'm having a guy who hosts a podcast called Shit Happens When You Party Naked. Like his name's Almy, yeah. cool guy, and he starts on because you know one of the things my podcast does is the five for five. Yeah, it's five questions, five answers to, to get the ball rolling. So one of the questions was like, I'm trying to word it correctly. I was like, <laughs> what are you gonna carry? What do you carry with you during the zombie apocalypse? You can take five things, and he just out of the blue says, cats will be a <laughs> cats. Will be a high commodity in the zombie apocalypse for, for, for fucking. I'm like, what? what are you talking about? <laughs> and he gets in this long tirade about how cats would be the most important thing in the zombie apocalypse. So, and it's crazy because it, that, that episode went from that conversation that was so wild and unbelievable, like, huh, what is going on here? To him talking about him being a bodybuilder and, and a steroid addiction. Are you yeah, serious? It's, it's, yeah, it's a crazy episode that I highly recommend people check out because it goes from two different scenarios. This is what the podcast does. You never know what you're going to hear from people because it goes from one wild story mm-hmm. about cat fucking to a situation where he gets really deep and serious about how he was, how he was a professional bodybuilder and how competitive it was and how he got addicted to steroids and other drugs. And it's a, a fascinating turn. Dude, yeah, I, I need I need to go listen to this one because I'm like that that's that that's like you and I being on the opposite side of the country. How that do you how do you go from cat fucking to bodybuilding? Yes, <laughs> that's exactly what it is. You know, it's crazy because you know it's just the flow of conversation. Every time a guest comes on, you've even said it. That's how one of the reasons why we become became friends so fast is that um. Every time a guest usually comes on, one of the constant things they always say is that, man, you're so easy to talk to. It's just, mm-hmm. it, it didn't feel like it went so fast because we were just having a natural conversation. I think that's one of the things that you do well as well. When you have a conversation with a person that doesn't feel like an interview, it feels mm-hmm. like two people talking and having a conversation. Now, that's very important in terms of when you're podcasting and when you're talking to a person. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Like I, I... And honestly, man, I have to say this. I got to give all credit to you because really what shaped the way I flow my conversations is after I had my interview with you or our conversation, rather. Because yeah. before I would just have, you know, scripted questions. It'd be like a and a type of format. And then I got to the point where I'm like, man, in real life, I can't do scripted shit at all. I just like, you know, I hit record and we go and we just talk and we just talk about whatever you know, the person's into, what I'm into, what they're doing. And, you know, going on your show, and this is why people, I, I highly recommend, I highly, in the top 10 podcasts in the world, <laughs> Thank you, bro. Delvin Cox Experience is number one for me. I actually do. I, 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 I am very influenced by your show because, honestly, man, going on your show, the way you just did the five for five, that that really is an icebreaker. It really is. Yeah. You know? it, it works so well. Yeah. <laughs> because it opens people up to be relaxed. Because a lot of times, like I give you an example. An episode that's coming up this week. Mm-hmm. I have um a political analyst named Carmine Sabia. He works for the Federalist Papers papers. Trump oh, yeah. supporter. That's the one you're telling me about. Yeah, Trump supporter, everything. I already interviewed him and stuff like that. He was a little uneasy but coming on the first. He's like, oh, yeah. He said, because he knows I'm I'm not a Trump supporter or whatnot. Mm-hmm. I give him the five for five. We start talking about wrestling because he used to be a wrestling promoter. Mm-hmm. 
Then by the time we got to the Trump stuff, we were so engaged in having conversations, talking like we've been boys forever. He was like, man, this is too much fun. We, we don't have to stop. We can talk forever. <laughs> and, and, and literally, the episode is probably an hour long. Yeah, I may have talked to him for four hours to the point where he was like, yo, here's my number. Me, you can talk anytime. We, we are boys now. And that's, how, and that's how it works, man. You know, just talking to people and hearing their experiences and hearing, hearing them out. And that episode, by the way, is going to be fascinating because we talk about a lot of stuff mm-hmm. about politics that you don't even expect. I'm looking forward to it. No, but I mean, and that's the thing, man, when you get that conversation going, that organic conversation, and I really, I really learned that from you as how important that is, because you can have people with completely different viewpoints, politically, ideologically, and more. But if you can have that icebreaker moment and just talk, I really believe that. And I think that's one of the problems we have in this country right now is people can't just talk and agree to disagree, but still have something in common and they can enjoy the interaction with one another. And like to hear that, man, that that's something because in a way you and I are politically different to yes. certain extents. Yes. Um, I'm not French. I know uh, some people have called me far right. I've been called far right recently. And I'm like, I haven't said anything political <laughs> in, in, in months. I mean, even you've noticed, like I steered away from politics I think we had a conversation about that. Like, yeah, you can't stay away from it because it's not, it's going to drain you. Because no matter what angle you take on it, it's almost like you're choosing a side. Yeah. And even if you take the slightest edge to right or the slightest edge to left, they're going to say you're a social justice warrior or you hate people and stuff like that, or racist and stuff. So you kind of have to, there's very few people who can get in the lane of politics. And navigate in a way where they're loved by both sides. Yeah, yeah. I think Obama did a, does, does a good job at it in terms of how, even when he says stuff that the right doesn't necessarily agree with. Mm-hmm. In the day, a lot of people on the right love Obama. They'll say, yeah. you know what, we don't like his policies, but we feel like he's a good person. Yeah, I think that's how politics should be in terms of how. I, I don't necessarily have to agree with everything you say. Yeah, but in the, the day, we have to say, you know what. That guy's a good person. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I look at it like the situation we had out here in Hawaii or we're having out here in Hawaii about the, the, the Mauna Kea, the TNT, the telescope that they're putting on a uh, big island on Mauna Kea. And we have people that are anti. Okay. So they say they're anti telescope. They're actually anti America because there's this major push out here to annex Hawaii from the U.S. And you're not That's supposed a terrible to. Idea. It is. It That's is a really bad idea. Didn't they learn anything from Brexit? Yeah. <laughs> you, you Imagine tell you something right there. You can't tell people out here that. And and the thing is, like, I and I'm not. I, I've had to learn how to do this. I have to learn now how to not shit on people in Hawaii. Because yeah. Because understand it, that. You know, and, and I tried my hardest not to, but there's some shit that just does not make sense to me, like. I don't understand this, how all these people can come together over a fucking telescope on a mountain that's sacred. And you cannot come together to help the homeless situation we have out here, the broken homes, the drug issues that we have, the, I mean, like the employment issues aren't even here anymore. There are so many jobs because you got people that don't have the qualification to get them because the biggest problem in Hawaii, one, well, one of the biggest is education. People drop out of school in middle school, in junior high, in high school, and then they expect to get a job at McDonald's and that take care of them for the rest of their life. And it doesn't work that way. you know. And it's like you can come together for a telescope to make sure that doesn't happen because you want to keep Hawaii for Hawaiians, not for anyone else. And they want to be on this whole, we hate white people thing. And white people are why we've got all these condos being built, all this land being bought up and all these things going on. But they don't look at the real fact who is in power out here in Hawaii, who owns these condos. It ain't the white people. Whites are not even a majority out here. The people who run Hawaii are Asian. 
They own all, you know, and they don't even live in the U.S. They live in Japan. They live in China. They buy up the land here. They put up all these condos. All the tourists are typically, the majority of tourists out here are Asian. But you've got this this thing, this, this we hate white people. And then the other thing they don't really talk about, they hate black people out here. And the locals and military or locals and black tourists, not a good combination. Not at all. But we can come together. We can talk about a damn telescope. Can't address real issues in Hawaii. But you know what? I'm not shitting on people in Hawaii, even though I just did. <laughs> no, that's society in general, because people have a tendency to run away from the real problems. Yeah. Unless it's clickbait or pop cultures. Mm-hmm. Like, I'll give you a perfect example of that. All the problems that we have going on in our government today. Mm-hmm. Anytime somebody says something bad about Trump or Trump does something that's bad, there's always another story that takes away from that. Yeah. And nine times out of ten, that story is complete bullshit. <laughs> there's mm-hmm. nothing of any significance whatsoever. But it takes people's minds off of it so people don't care. Like, even this story with the whole thing with kids and cages and things like that, people care now. But unfortunately, something's going to come along and will take that story off people's mindsets. Mm-hmm. I think that's one of the brilliant things about Trump, if you want to give him credit for anything, is the fact that he knows he's very well aware of that kind of trick that um, people have short attention spans for things. So yeah. he'll do something. People will get mad for that time and say how much they don't like him and things like that. And then something else will happen that will take completely away from that. People will just forget about it. Yeah. Yep. They completely do. And it's... it's uh, it... I, I, and it's I, I feel like it's it's in politics, it's in you know gaming, it's in tech, it's in everything. It's like something comes out, it's hot for like a good week to two weeks, maybe a month, and then once that passes, forgotten. Yeah, forgotten. you're absolutely correct. We and, we we seen that um, last year in gaming. Remember, how everybody was talking how bad Fallout seventy six was and how yep. awful it was, and then all of a sudden. <laughs> Um, Anthem was like, hold my beer. Then everybody yep. just completely forgot that Fallout 76 was the best. Everybody just was crap, crapping on Anthem and EA and everything like that. That's how it is. It's just people look for that hot story, that hot article, the thing that's going to rile people up. Yep. Yep. And wasn't it the people we're talking about, what is it, the, uh, the Switch Lite? People yes. were talking about that for a hot minute. Now, you don't hear anything. <laughs> anything at all about it. <laughs> People just have short attention spans these days. And it sucks because especially if you are doing the things like me and you do in terms of podcasting and things like that, because we'll drop an episode that may have staying power, but people are always like, okay, what's the next thing you're going to do? What's the next thing you're going to do? What's the next thing you're going to do? Can't wait till next week. Sometimes you got to sit there and enjoy stuff and just cherish it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we could go into a rant about, you know, the, the game you picked up, Wolfenstein Youngblood. <laughs> yeah, well, that, 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 that infuriated me. I'm not going to lie. Because I, I'll tell the story. Go for it. I went to GameStop a couple of days ago before it came out. I think I was, oh, I don't know what it was. My daughter, Switch, got missing. So a couple of weeks back, I bought her a new Switch. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, she's a good girl. She does her thing. So a couple of days ago, I went in because one she had Mario Maker 2 inside her Switch that got missing. Mm-hmm. And she's been working. She saved the money to buy another copy. So I took her to buy another copy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they always ask you at GameStop, do you want to pre-order something? And yeah. on the door at GameStop, they had a big sign for the Wolf- Wolfenstein Youngblood. So I was like, oh, that's cool. Now, it didn't say anything about, oh, it's just the code. I said, so, hey, and I, was like, I asked her, so, can I pre-order that? Like, yeah, 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 we got that in style. You can pre-order that. So, I pre-order it. I say, I'll pay for it in full right now. Pay for it in full. Go to pick it up Friday. I get there. I said, let me get the game. The guy looks at the thing. He picks the game up. Says, oh, this is weird. Like, what's weird about it? He showed me the game box. The game box says, cartridge not included. It's a download code. So my first thoughts is, why 
give me a download code and a box. The box literally has no type of stuff in it. It's just literally a box and a download code. It makes no sense whatsoever. And it confused me because like I was, I, several things came to mind. One of the things is, what if I was a kid, for example, who didn't, who doesn't have internet, and I'm still right. to get get Wolfenstein. I'm thinking because the, the guys at GameStop didn't realize this either. Like this is weird because usually when you buy codes from GameStop, they just give you the receipt with the code on it. Yeah, it's not in a box. Yeah, you know. And so they were like, "This, you know, what if I was a kid who didn't have internet, or nothing like that, and I buy this game, I get this box with just the code in it. I am screwed." You are. You really are. <laughs> and plus, it's just a waste of plastic in general, just to have a box with no cartridges in it, no chotskis or anything like that. It's just the code. And it, it's just so baffling and confusing to how much of a waste of money that is. Yeah. It, it, it goes to show you the direction the gaming industry is going in. They're really pushing for this digital only. And yeah. you... I, it's, it's smart business in the sense that they control it and you don't own anything yes and when you get to the point where it's like it's download only and the other thing you see that they push in a lot of these games is you have to be connected to the internet yes that's something i'm not very fond of because sometimes things happen what if the internet craps out right and you just can't play games that day what if you have situations like, um, for example, um, a couple of years down here we had a hurricane. Mm -hmm. We had no power. Oh, so I was, and I think it was, it was right when the switch first came out. Mm -hmm. The only oh, yeah, game, that, that big hurricane. Yeah, 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 I remember that. Yeah. One. So the only game, one, only game I had that was like, because that was around the time I think the only big game they had at the time was Breath of the Wild for Switch. They had other yeah. games that were small, but it wasn't nothing major, major, major. Yeah. So imagine if Breath of the Wild was online only <laughs> and I have no power, no nothing. I'm screwed. Mm -hmm. And that plays a big part into how I feel about this connectivity thing. Well, I think is we need to have a balance for both. I'm yeah. just not ready to get rid of card discs yet and just be always online for gaming because you have too many situations where they're showing you that, hey, at any time we could take away your game. Mm -hmm. For example, that with the whole thing with uh, Telltale and um, yep. what is it? Minecraft. Where people who pay for this game, if you don't download it, if you or you didn't have it downloaded at the time, you just lost your game. Mm -hmm. And that sucks. For something you paid for, you just they can just take it away from you essentially. You got no ownership. It, it, it's a terrifying thing. It really is. And it's like, it, it, you, you see what they do. What they do is they'll take it, they'll make it a lot of these games now digital only. You get it. Yeah. And, or they'll re release something like, say they, they do something like, uh, what is it? Uh, last generation, you had Marvel versus Capcom 2 and 1 digital only download. If you didn't buy it when it was there, you can't play it anymore. And then they're going to turn around somewhere down the line and re-release it at a premium price. Yeah. Which sucks. <clears throat> yeah. With absolutely nothing added to it. <laughs> yeah, it, it really sucks because you, it's getting to a point now where they're going to just tax you and tax you for games that you don't even own, essentially. Mm -hmm. Because that, like I said, anytime they can take them away, and it seems like that everybody's trying to go towards the streaming thing. And I don't know how in that it is in Hawaii, but there are plenty of spots in the United States where where streaming one has data caps. Yep. And you go over that data cap, you have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And when you're trying to stream 4K games, that's going to take up a lot. That's one of the reasons why I was like, I don't know if I'm getting Stadia because it's going like I have Comcast here. Mm -hmm. Comcast gives you one terabyte. And once you go over that terabyte, every 20 gigabytes is ten dollars extra. Well, at the very so least, gonna... you have the option to get in Stadia. We can't get it out here. They don't even 
You can't even pre-order it and have it sent you. God, that's crazy. Yeah, I, I reached out to them. I was like, is there a reason why I can't order or pre-order it? They're like, yeah, you know, the infrastructure is not there in Hawaii. I'm like, okay. So you're treating us like we're our own little country. That sucks. Can you can you import it? Um, Which is crazy to say because Hawaii's part of the United States, but <laughs> it's like, it's, it's a weird situation where you're like, oh, can I just have it sit here? No, because I wanted a Founders Edition and I can't get it because I can't, it, they won't ship it to Hawaii. So I'd have to have someone else. I had to order it and have it sent to somebody else and then have them send it to me. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. So it's like, all right. I, I mean, I already had to do that with batteries. Like if I want a battery backup for like my Switch like or a battery case or just any type of backup or battery at all, I can't even get a fucking battery for my camera because... That's crazy. You know, there's these regulations about sending stuff to Hawaii. So if I want it, I got to order it, have it sent to somebody in the mainland, have them mail it to me. Because Amazon and Walmart, all these companies online, they won't send it at all. And then the only thing we have out here for tech stores is Best Buy. And they barely got shit out here. So. Wow. That sucks. It's it's hard. It is hard. That's why, like, I don't even bother with trying to, like, people like, oh, yeah, you should just build a computer. The fuck am I going to build a computer out here for? I can't even get parts. You can't even get parts to build it, so. That that sucks, man. I mean, we got groups out here. Like, there, there's a company uh, that does like esports, and they build custom computers out here. But they, man, they charge like a fucking arm and a leg. Like, oh, if I'm gonna get a computer with an i, I think they they're selling this one computer had an i5 processor and a twenty seven a ten seventy graphics card for like almost two grand. Wow. And, and I'm like, I could walk into Best Buy get an i7 or i9 and get the latest graphics card and i can spend 1700 they're like oh well this is supporting local business fuck that i'm taking money i'm a cheap bastard (laughs) (laughs) yeah man you know you gotta especially when we're doing what we do you gotta kind of pinch your pennies man this stuff ain't cheap to be podcasting and streaming and all that stuff you know and you can't just be getting nickel and dime everywhere you go, especially Hawaii just seems like such a different place from the United States. Almost like it's not even connected, which is so weird because so many regulations that just stop you from getting the basic things like, I would have never known that you couldn't just stay here. Nope. nope. That sucks. The price of everything I hear is just ridiculous. If I want to get milk, I'm paying 6 $7 a gallon. Jeez. For a big jug and dude, that's why i was mad when i went to indianapolis for training uh like two years ago and i went there i was i went to a store and the, the milk was like two dollars or a dollar yeah. something for like a jug and i'm like can i just freeze this and ship it to hawaii <laughs> <laughs> you might need to start buying it on is it pomelat yeah because they have pomelat here for like a dollar a quart and you know, Pomelat is um, it doesn't go bad when you ship it. Oh man! See, I need to do that, or I need to find someone who got military access so I can go to the commissary. <laughs> yeah, that's the other thing that would be good. <laughs> Six dollars for a gallon of milk is way too much. Man, that's why it's so funny because they they try to tell you all the time out here, like you need to, you know, we we should stop eating out so much we should just cook and and eat the prep meal prep and all that i'm like the money it costs me to do a fucking meal prep i could just eat out for cheaper so i do that's crazy i do like i i eat it i know it's bad i eat fast food almost every day just because it's cheaper than trying to buy groceries and cook I mean, if I'm gonna fill, if I'm gonna halfway fill my fridge, I'm probably spending about 150, 270 dollars. That's crazy. Yeah. That is insane. To just halfway fill it. I mean, yeah. you know, one of the things about that I like about Miami is that there's a lot of local grocery stores, 
mm-hmm. and they're super cheap. When I say super cheap, you can buy like meat and feed your family for like six, seven bucks, like chicken, good chicken. Because they're local and they, they, they get the stuff fresh and they chop it up and you see it all fresh and full, you can just pick it out and they, it's really cheap. Now that, you know, you have the regular grocery store like Publix and Dixie and stuff like that, that's yeah. a little more, more expensive, but the local business game down here is pretty good. I can't complain about that at all. Like I just bought a box of tilapia the other day for like 15 bucks. The and it's a lot of tilapia. Of, the box of tilapia I hear is like oh, damn near $40. Yeah. Jesus. I need, I need to go there. I, I mean, <laughs> I'm telling you, man. <laughs> you've been telling me I need to move to Miami anyway. Yeah, man. It's nice down here, man. It's a lot of the sim- similarities to Hawaii in terms of how things look. You got the beach and stuff like that. You got the beautiful women. You got the whole location thing. But Miami's a big city. Man, I'm telling you, <clears throat> I, I, I got to go in about the women out here in Hawaii. <laughs> I got to go in. I got to go in. So you, you got two types of women in Hawaii, two types. And you got the ones that are fine. And then you got the ones that are like, which pronoun should I use? <laughs> <laughs> It's like, um, I don't even know how you describe it. Like, you know, oh, I know how you describe it. Like, like a lot of Spanish women are. They say a lot of Spanish women. Sometimes you look at Spanish women, you can see the ones that are just gorgeous. Mm-hmm. And you got the ones who don't age well when they get older. Yeah, this, this shit going to hit the floor. <laughs> so <saying>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As soon as they hit a certain age, it just hit the floor, man. It's, it's crazy to think about it, but like, hey, man. When they say black don't crack, black do not crack, man. It There's women down here that are 50, 60 years old that will give some of these 20-year-olds a run for their money. I, I can believe it, man. I've, I've seen some that come out here, and they're like, I'm like, I, at one point, like, when I was single, I was hitting on, on this one chick, and she's like, I'm old enough to be your mama. I'm like, what? She's like, yeah. <laughs> she's like, I, I'm 67 years old. I'm like, Yeah. That's the thing. <laughs> That's the thing. But but you know, I don't, it, when I was single, black women wouldn't give me the time of day. So I, I don't know. They definitely would now, because <laughs> you they all you gotta do is say you're on YouTube, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody think YouTubers are are millionaires. <laughs> so. Dude, I, I I get that shit at work because like. Like, you know, like I work at a hospital, so I try, I I do my damnedest not to say anything about the fact that I work or or like I do YouTubing or I do podcasting. And somehow one of the women that in the call center I work at, they'll find out about it. And then they say, they're like, oh, how much are you making? You must be famous, huh? You're big time. And I'm over here like, uh, Okay. (laughs) <laughs> I'm a small YouTuber, but sure, yeah. I'm up there with the Paul brothers. I'm up there, you know? <laughs> you know, it's crazy when people, because now podcasting is becoming like the end thing. Yeah, do you know everyone's doing a podcast now? Yeah, I think, oh, Macaulay Culkin is doing one, which I didn't know was a thing. Everybody and their mama's getting a podcast now. Because it's becoming an it thing. People are starting to profit off a of podcast and companies like iHeart and Spotify are just throwing money at people just so they can have their podcast exclusive to their network. And it's becoming a big deal now. And when me and you started, it wasn't that. No. You no, know, podcasts are kind of this niche thing where people just enjoyed it. But now it's kind of like blown up. And before, I used to tell people I had a podcast, they didn't care. I remember like, oh yeah, what the hell is that? Don't care. Now it's like, you have a podcast? Oh, how is it? What is it like to do the podcast? Hey man, I heard the podcast. Like, I told you I had a podcast three years ago. You didn't listen then. Now you want to listen? <laughs> it's crazy. Like um, when I went, to, I went to WWE SmackDown this past week. Mm-hmm. And my boy, he makes these cool shirts that says, um, what does it say? Um, support indie podcast. Mm-hmm. I need to get one. So, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get a link to it. Let me see if I can find his link. I want to shout him out real quick so we see if I can find his info. But I got one in the shirt from him, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I I didn't want to wear a wrestling shirt to the event. I was I was almost front row at SmackDown. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to wear one of those shirts to it, like a wrestling shirt or anything like that. So I wore my indie podcast shirt. So my whole idea was if I get on camera, I'd rather them see that yep. than see my Seth Rollins shirt or Roman Reigns shirt or something like that, you know. Mm -hmm. And I took a picture and it kind of blew up a little bit on the internet. It's like, wow, yeah, man, we should support indie podcasts. And I put it on Facebook and stuff. Now everybody's like, yeah, yeah, I support indie podcasts. Man, I'm definitely, I'm like, you motherfucker don't even know what an indie podcast is. <laughs> no clue. But, you know, it's very important to me to support podcasts, especially independent ones, because, you know, we're the backbone of this shit. Yeah, we're the ones who are keeping it going. Like, it's easy to get somebody who's well known and established to have a podcast and get a million listeners and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And the content might not be good, but it's a lot different when you get somebody who, a relatively unknown person, they come up and they're fighting every year to build their podcast base till they have a quality podcast that you can listen to every day and you can enjoy it. And you can watch them come from the bottom. To the top, and I think that's one of the appeals that a lot of people have with not a necessarily a podcast, but PewDiePie. Mm -hmm. And why he has such a diehard fan base because people watched him from the bottom to him having like three listeners to this big mega star that he is today. That's why it's hard to, no matter how many people have tried to take down PewDiePie, it's almost impossible because he has such a dedicated fan base. When he gets into controversy, they don't care because they followed him since day one. And when you built that with people, it's really hard to take that away. You literally have to do something heinous to get that love that you get from podcasting or YouTube taken away from you. Oh, let me give you the guy's name. Go If you guys want to end the podcast show, go check out at Podcast Junkie on Twitter. He sells the shirts. Dope guy. He also reviews podcasts. And he's very nice about it. Great guy. Great shirt, man. All right, definitely. I'll leave a link to uh, his his uh, for we for people to go and buy that, and also I'll leave a link to his uh, social media and his podcast and everything like that. So people definitely go and support indie podcasts because we are this is real people. We are the backbone. We're the ones who were doing this before it was popular, before people knew what the fuck it was. We're the ones yeah. that are still doing it when all these people are hopping on and we're the ones that'll still be doing it when all the people move on to something else, because this is something yeah. we're passionate about. And it's just something because like one of the things I'm having the, uh, the hardest time with is getting people to leave a rating or review on a podcast. And it's like, I've been doing this for like two years now. And I've, you know, I've helped like, you know, and, and, and shout out to my, my boy, Chris Van Vliet, you know, I, in his ear about do you should take your interviews with wrestlers on YouTube, move it to the podcast. So he ended up doing that like a couple, uh, I think a month ago or a couple weeks ago. And he did that. That dude already's got like 40, 50, 100 some reviews and ratings. And I'm over here like, man, I can't even get people who listen to my shit to do that. And I, I think that's the other side of the podcast and people don't know about like the, the back end of it. You know, you need to get ratings because then it'll get pushed more. You know, yeah, that's it's very important to rate and review podcasts because that helps people find your podcast for one thing, mm -hmm. and it's essential for people to find your podcast because they don't find it, they can't listen, you yeah. can't build it. And most podcasters want to make money off their podcast eventually, and I think that having that reach to build building listeners and things. Ask you to be able to get sponsors and ad dollars and things like that that I think are essential for us to podcast because podcasting ain't free. No, it's not. You, know, you got to pay to have servers to download, and upload the podcast, stuff like that. You got to pay for equipment. There's a lot of things that come with hidden costs that come with podcasting. Yeah, true enough, you can just grab your phone and record it and make a podcast. But if you want to take it to that next level, to build it up, you're gonna have to put some money into it. You're gonna have to put money into things like even marketing, like even getting a Mikhail Casanova shirt made so you can sell 
and support your favorite podcast. That costs money and costs time, man. You know, yep. and it's very important because, like I said, we don't have the reach of Joe Rogan, Rogan and things like that. So we have to kind of build and grind from the bottom and get people the old fashioned way where we go out there and speak and preach on why our podcast is good and great. Mm-hmm. And this is for all people who do, whether it's YouTube, podcast, and Twitch. You got to go out there every day and build your audience. If you're not willing to do that every day. You're not going to get what you want to get at. Yeah. And it's a lot of work. Yep. It's a lot of work. And, and that's the thing, too, is like people that, that come to me and they're talking about, hey, oh, I want to start a podcast. Oh, I want to start a YouTube channel. You know, oh, I, I, I see you're doing well. And this is something like my, I got to give a shout out to my, my boy, uh, Fabian from uh, Gaming Thumb TV. Really good. I, I think you guys are in the same area. And um, one of the things him and I, we, we talk about is how people always approach us because they want to, they see what we're doing. And they're thinking they're just going to hop in and be at the level we're at. And it's not to be arrogant and say like, we're anywhere, you know, like we're, we're top dog or top yeah. shit or anything, but where we are now, we took a minute to get here. It took a long while to get here. And this idea that a lot of people have, they can just hop in and they don't have to put in the work or people have this expectation that you're going to carry them to get to where they need to be. And it's like, no, is this is work. This is work. You know, you, you got to market. The marketing is not easy. You got to give incentives for people to come back, you know, whether, whether that's means certain guests, certain merch, certain topics you cover, certain opinions. It, it's work. You know, the editing, you know, whether you're using USB mics or XLR mics, you got to have good equipment because if your podcast has shitty audio, ain't nobody going to listen to it. Yes. You know, um, I tell people all the time, they're like, oh, I just want to record from my phone. Yeah, you can do that. But if you want people to come back consistently, you need to invest in a good mic. And a lot of people don't want to do that. I'm like, yeah, you're going to have to spend at least 50 to 100 bucks on a good quality USB mic. Like I tell people all the time, you want a starter mic or a mic that's going to go with you the whole way through, get a Yeti. Yes. Yeti's very good. Yeah. And plus you can find, always find them. They're always on sale. All the time. Especially the one that has the um, Assassin's Creed Origin bundle. Mm-hmm. That was like 70, 80 bucks. And it comes with a game. Yep. Everything you need right there. Yes. Does it, come with, does it come with software too? I, I know Yeti's been partnering up with, uh, or Blue's been partnering up with this podcasting thing or this this audio. Uh, I can't think of the name of the company. There's one point they were pushing like podcast software. Yeah, mine didn't because I bought mine a while ago. It just came with Assassin's Creed Origins, but I think it, it's starting to come with like podcasting software now. But uh, like, let's talk about that, man. Like, how do you like with your show when it comes to like the marketing and, you know, the promoting and getting guests, like all of the back end stuff? <clears throat> how is your workflow with it? Well, I when I record my episodes in advance because I never want to miss a week. Mm-hmm. And you always have situations where guests can't come out. Guests can't do it that day. Something happens. And. If you're recording week to week and a guest calls out, that just messes up your whole schedule for podcasting. And then you're just stuck. And you got to scramble to find another guest, things like that. And that's a hassle. So I always kind of try to record in advance mm-hmm. and get it, get a little system going with that. And I always try to talk to other podcasters to reach out to them and get their opinions on feedback and things like that. And even have them listen to the podcast because they can be your greatest allies if you start getting other podcasts and other YouTubers and things to listen and support you because if you support them and they support you, you guys can kind of build together and help reach different audiences. And plus, another thing I always do is I go outside of my comfort zone mm-hmm. in terms of like, I'm an African-American male. <clears throat> there are thousands and thousands of great podcasts just talking about black issues and things mm-hmm. like that. I didn't want to do that because I know there's thousands and thousands of podcasts that do that already. Yeah. And I, I don't want to, frankly, I don't want to be a quote unquote black podcast where every week I just interview another black person to have a conversation with. I want to open the doors to people who a black man wouldn't necessarily talk to all the time. 
-hmm. because not only because it's a challenge for me, but I think it's informative to us as black people in terms of finding out what makes the other side tick, what makes white people tick, what makes Asian people tick, what makes Latinos tick. You know, let's get into what makes different people think the way they think mm -hmm. and kind of go in deep, deeper and deeper into that facet. Because like I said, I can bring any of my friends on here from the streets and things like that. And we can have a conversation, talk all day. But I've heard that conversation a thousand times. Eventually, that's gonna get boring to me. Mm -hmm. But if I bring somebody who's from a completely different background, maybe from Kentucky, maybe where they didn't necessarily like black people over there, <clears throat> bring them on the podcast, talk to them, have a conversation with them, get a different output on things. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and that's the thing too, is like, you know, and I, and I get that out here. People tell me like, oh, you don't cater. Th like, God, I, I fucking hate this. I get told all the time, I don't cater to people in Hawaii. I don't cater to the Hawaiian audience. And I'm like, because you already have podcasts out here. They're talking about issues out here. They're talking about, you know, the the, the telescope on Mauna Kea or all this other stuff. I'm like, I don't want to talk about that. You know, I, I want to talk to other people that I don't have, I mean, I have anything in common with. You know, I, I want to broaden my horizons as I'm broadening the horizon of my audience at the same time. And it's just... When you are able to reach out and do something different, go against the grain, I think that builds quality, personally. Yes, it definitely does. And it helps because you become better at it. Yeah. Because things happen in the podcast that you may not expect, and then you get have to adapt and be ready for it. And that makes for interesting content. Yeah. You know, I, I found out... Uh, you know, like one of the podcasts I did, I think the longest podcast I ever did was like five hours long. And that five hours just felt like it was like half an hour. It was just flowing all organic conversation, topic to topic. Uh, it was with another podcast that's actually out here in Hawaii. And she's a co-host of a very popular podcast in New York. And I'm like, yo, I would never have known that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's like she's out here and she says the same thing, like, her thing is she's not trying to be talking about the stuff that everyone in Hawaii is talking about. And I'm like, I like that. <laughs> I like yeah. that. It's very important to be creative and go your own path. Like, and I tell, because now it's gotten to the point that I've been doing this for so long, other podcasts, other people come asking for advice. And I tell them just to go follow their own path and do it. You're yeah. not going to hit 50 listeners probably in your first episode. You may not even hit 10. For all you know, but that doesn't mean you stop. That means you keep going, you keep pushing, you keep building on your podcast, you keep communicating with people about your podcast because it's very easy to to record a podcast, put it out there, then don't talk about it, don't talk to people and stuff like that, and just do it again and over. But you're not going to build that way. You have to go out there, reach the people, touch some hands, man. You know, politic in terms of like getting yourself out there because eventually, if people hear your name enough. They're gonna know who you are. They're gonna check at least. They're gonna at least check out your stuff. Yeah, and that's the main thing, you know, getting your name out there so people can give you a look, and they may like it, they may not like it, but at least you've gotten that look. Yeah, dude, that, that's one of the things too. Like when I went to E3, I was shocked when I was seeing people I'm a fan of. They're like, "Hey, you're the guy that has a podcast in Hawaii." I was like, "How the fuck do you know?" <laughs> That's speaking, awesome, though. Speak, speaking of which, bro, I found out as a podcaster, <laughs> if you got, I think for E3, if you got at least 50 ratings, you can go to E3 for free. I did not know that. I yeah. think I have over 50 ratings, if I'm correct. I might have well over 50 ratings. Yeah, I think you got well over. <laughs> I got well over 50 ratings. If I remember correctly, like a lot of these uh, events, like PAX, uh, TwitchCon, BlizzCon, um, E3, I didn't even know as a podcaster you can get in for free like that. You know, and I gotta give a big shout out to uh, Danny and uh, Andrew Alliance of the show Radio Podcast because that's who I found that out through. I never knew. I never. That's knew. great. That's 
So I better be seeing you at E3. <laughs> That's a good idea. I might just do that, man, because I need to get out more, see the states, man. Go to E3, go to PAX, go to events like that, have a little fun with it. Yeah. Yeah, man, like definitely. I, 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 when I found that out, I'm like, yo, I've been doing this wrong the whole time. That's why, like, I don't even market myself as like a YouTuber anymore. I'm like content creator slash podcaster. And like, people are like, oh, well, what's content creation? That encompasses everything. Yeah. <laughs> Twitch, YouTube, podcasting, you name it, you do it, brother. And that's good. That's really good because it opens more do- doors for you in terms of like, Eventually, you're going to get to that point where you're going to start hosting events. Yeah. Yeah. And that's going to be really dope to see. Yeah. Be out there with a suit and tie like Greg Miller. Nothing wrong with that at all, brother. (laughs) Dude, you know what's funny is like when I do like the events that I help out with out here in Hawaii, like I do that. Like I'll show up to an event. I'll have a suit and tie on. People are like, why are you wearing that in Hawaii? Like people out here don't do that. I'm like, yeah, but it's presentation. Yes. All presentation. They're like, oh, well, well, only Howleys or white people dress up. I'm like, no, that's not true. Not true at all. No, nope. So I gotta mm-hmm. ask. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Ask, go ahead and ask me. I was gonna ask you about um, when it comes to podcasting, like hosting sites. Um, I okay. So for the longest, I was using um, Shout Engine just because when I got into podcasting with my former friend. Um, that's what he found out. He just wanted a free alternative. He didn't want to pay for like one. Well, I think I forgot what a couple of the sites you got to pay for. He didn't want to do that, so he used Shout Engine. So I, when I, you know, when him and I we fell out and I started my own podcast, I went with Shout Engine, and I didn't know about Libsyn and Spreaker and Podbean and all these other outlets I could have just used to host it. And would have been better for me because they they also not only host it but they'll promote you. Shout yes. engine don't do shit like, and it, that's the other thing too about Shout Engine. Me trying to port, you know, import that over to or export it to like another site. Their customer service is dead, bro. Their Twitter nobody handles it. You email them, they'll respond to you. So I was like, God damn, I got like a year and a half of content. I can't. It well, I could somewhat import the RSS feed, but like, it was having so many issues. I was actually having to manually download and re-upload episodes when I moved over to Launchpad. And I I love Launchpad, you know, my podcast one. I love them. But then I'm hearing everyone say, man, you should have went with Libsyn. You should have went with Spreaker. And I'm like, God damn it. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I've been getting that too. But so far, like, I'm I'm on all, I use SoundCloud. Really? Yeah, I use SoundCloud. I use I pay for the SoundCloud premiere. And one of the reasons why I first went to SoundCloud is because simply because people know SoundCloud. You know, it's so widely known. Yeah. And it's it's easily accessible for people to find the podcast. It's easy to get the podcast everywhere when you're on SoundCloud and you have it accessible. Like for example, when I got my podcast on SoundCloud. A lot of people always say they, it took them a while to get their podcast on iTunes. My podcast got on iTunes almost immediately. No problems. I haven't had a problem with it been, being on iTunes since. It's been on iTunes, no problem. It's been on Spotify, no problem. Everywhere you can think of podcast being, my podcast is there. And I think a great part of that plays with me. It's been on SoundCloud for so long. Man, I'm looking it up right now. I didn't even know I should have did that. God See, one of the reasons why I did SoundCloud because it's, you pay for a year, I think it's like 100 some 120 bucks a year, something like that, and it's unlimited um, streaming, unlimited, unlimited downloads, unlimited uploads. Jeez. And that's the main, that's the main biggest feature to me. So I can put anything I want to in my SoundCloud, and not to worry about it. Ain't got to worry about it getting taken away. They gotta worry about saying you are gonna reach your download limit for the month or something like that. Nah, man, I'm gonna keep talking, man. I'm looking it up right now. I'm, <laughs> I'm pissed. Yeah, it's cool because, like I said, it's you need because podcast takes up a lot of space for one thing, 
and you need an avenue where you can be free to download and upload whatever you want when you want to do it. And now, like when I first started uh, on SoundCloud, you had uh, whatever time you wanted to for the podcast to come out, you had to upload it at that time. But now you can just upload it in advance and set it to come out at that time. You don't have to think about it no more. It's perfect. It works out perfect for me with no problem whatsoever. Like that. It's good. If you are a podcaster, I recommend checking out SoundCloud. Uh, it's a little expensive. Like there's a hundred bucks a year. It's like I think it's like twelve bucks a month or something like that. If you want to do it yeah. monthly, but it's well worth it. And you can monetize. Yes, they just added that. You can monetize your podcast on there. Bro, I'm not making no money off of Podcast One. Yeah, I think SoundCloud is might be something you can look into. Or get into a podcast network. Okay, let's talk about it. Dude, I don't know nothing well, about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you never had a podcast network trying to recruit you? No. No. Yeah, that, those are things now, man. Um, I'll tell you about that offline, but yeah, <laughs> that part of it all, all, offline. But yeah, there are networks out there who are a group of independent podcasters who have networks and they'll try to recruit you to your network. And a lot of times they'll handle things like hosting your podcast for you and getting advertisers. So you ain't got to worry about the cost of hosting your podcast or worry about getting advertisers. <laughs> Are you on? Yeah, do that stuff for you. Hmm? Are you you part of one? That will be revealed soon. Oh, okay. Probably yeah. independent, but it will be revealed soon. I will okay. say that I will say this. A few have reached out to me and offered to pay for my hosting and get advertising and stuff like that for me. 80-20 uh, split. I get 80%, they get 20%. Dude, the only thing I've ever had happen to me is like, what you call it? Podcast One DM me about Launchpad because I know they're really trying to get people on Launchpad to to go. And I guess that's the the testing grounds before you can go to Podcast One. So okay, I, I that's that's it. Like that's how I got on to Launchpad DM because I looked at it I'm like, oh, it's free hosting. Uh, it's really simple to upload. You can put custom pictures on because when I was on um, what you call it, um, Shout Engine, I couldn't do that at all. Like literally, it, Shout Engine was super archaic. But man. I've had plenty of offers for many different things, like to interview people. People hopped in my DM, they hopped in emails to me to interview people. I mean, get on podcasting networks, I think, to do commercials for podcasts and stuff like that. You'd be surprised some of the offers I've gotten because of my podcast. Man. I'm going about this all wrong. (laughs) (laughs) You just got to communicate and talk to people, man, because it opens doors. When you start talking to people about things and reaching out to other podcasters and letting them know about you. They Sometimes they'll be your biggest supporters and they'll tell people about you. That, that's kind of some of the things that's been happening to me off where they'll tell, I become cool with a podcast and they've been on my podcast and they'll tell somebody else, hey, that's the podcast you want to look out for. And people reach out. Hit me. Okay, we're going to talk offline about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm out here, like, dude, I got, as far as, like, my podcast support in Hawaii, okay, and I, I think I've said this before, i say it again. So, a lot of people think, when I say Hawaii is number one podcast, they think it's bullshit. No, it, it actually isn't. If you Google, just Google Hawaii's number one podcast, or you go on YouTube, or you go on Bing, or whatever, I'm the one that shows up in the rankings compared to other podcasts in Hawaii. Number one, which is dope. I have no support from Hawaii. Like people, a lot of you, to be honest, people in Hawaii don't listen to my podcast. They don't even know anything about it. 
but I had people in other countries, people in the mainland. I go places like, you know, I was in um, San Diego like a couple days ago for a training. And I'm walking around, people like, oh, you got the podcast in Hawaii. People know that. People in Hawaii, they have no idea who I, who I am. Or they know and they just don't care about what I do because they don't care about podcasting. They're, they're still out here trying to do raves. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's how it is sometimes. Because, like, I, I, like I told you before, like, my family doesn't really grasp how many people listen to my podcast and how many people enjoy my podcast. So when they see things like a couple times I've had where people come down to Miami and invited me out to dinner just because they were fans of the podcast. They're like, why are you going to dinner with them? I'm like, friends of the podcast. Right. They want to hang out with me. Like, yeah. They want to hang out with me. They come down, they, they've come down here for business or they come down here simply to see me. And they are like baffled by this. But I'm like, no, my podcast reaches people. And it's cool that it does that. And people want to come see me and holler at me when they come to Miami. Sometimes they don't even be planning to come to Miami. We're going to come to Miami and holler at you because they like the podcast that much. The podcast means that much to them. And I think when you build on it, I don't necessarily get that love from Miami because Miami doesn't look at podcasts like that. I think there's a few podcasts out there that Miami people, even Chris Van Bleak, he's on Channel 7 News down here every day. Drive, right? Yes. I don't think people really know him down here for being a podcaster or things like that, or, or all the reach that he has. They know him from Deco Drive. But, but yeah, you know, you and I both know Chris Van Vliet get love from everywhere. Yeah. He really does. He really does. And <laughs> yeah. Man, I tell you. It's crazy to think about, but it's not like sometimes you're not going to get that love and respect from your hometown because they don't know. I think Miami's kind of still behind the eight ball when it comes to podcasting because they don't really realize how big it's become yet. You know, Miami is still about hip hop culture and parties and raves. They don't really listen to podcasts like that as of yet. Mm -hmm. But I think once podcasting really hits down here, it's going to be a big impact. Because you don't like that. You don't really hear people talking about podcasts down here. You have a few you have a few podcasts in Florida that people like, but they don't really blow up like that because we're not known for podcasts. We're known for crazy things happening in Miami and Florida and stuff like that. But once podcasting really hits down here, it's gonna be big. Do you, do you think this whole wave right now where everyone's trying to hop on and be a podcaster, do you think that this I guess you can say trend? where everyone's starting one. How long do you think that's going to last? Or do you think that's going to be something that's going to have staying power? It's going to last for a couple of years. I think what's going to end up happening is <clears throat> what's happening what is happening now as we speak. And it's starting to even, it's even starting to weed itself out where <clears throat> you got a whole bunch of people starting podcasts who are celebrities. Mm -hmm. Then you have these podcasts failing. People are realizing it doesn't work like that. You're not going to get in the podcast and make a whole bunch of money off rip. Everybody's trying to be the next Joe Rogan, and not everybody can be Joe Rogan. Not everybody's going to get that eventual success that he got when he from working hard at podcasting. So yeah. you're going to have a lot of podcasts out there that's just going to straight up die, and it's going to be better for us in terms of how <clears throat> eventually these big companies that are offering these celebrities all that money are going to say, you know what? Instead of us getting celebrity, let's get somebody who's already established mm -hmm. and get them and give them the money so they can keep building on their base. And it's, it's the same thing like YouTubers. It's the same thing with YouTube. How people are starting to look for the next PewDiePie or the next big YouTube celebrity because they know if we back this person when they're small, once they get big, it's going to benefit us more. I think the same thing is going to happen with podcasting. You know, because like like I said, Macaulay Culkin has a podcast right now. There's a podcast for all any celebrity you can probably think about has some form of a podcast right now. Yeah. Because there's big money in it. Like if I remember correctly, it's Spotify is offering like contracts to people, exclusive contracts for podcast people. There's now a lot of big money contracts. They ain't give me enough. 
<laughs> and not everybody is going to succeed. Yeah. You know, for every Joe Button that gets a big money contract and doing a million plus podcasts a week, they're going to be hundreds of celebrities who are not going to hit those numbers because they are not getting into podcasts for the right reasons. So eventually that's just going to die out. Yeah. And the thing is, it's, it's exactly like you said, like people are just hopping in to trying to, I think people, and this is something like uh gamer thumb and I talk about all the time is the people that want to hop on YouTube, they want to do gaming and all this other stuff. And they, they do it because they see the money. And they don't realize that everyone can't do this. Anyone can start it. Not everyone can succeed. And I think that's something in a lot of aspects of our culture, especially in America now, where there's this push for inclusivity and this idea that there is equal outcome for everybody, like no matter what physical or whatever situation they have, that everyone can have the same result. No, there's too many factors that, make that an impossibility like we can have the same equipment we can have all the same topics but that doesn't mean we're going to have the same equal outcome because you can't factor in drive uh how much you really want it how much you can market it how much you can put into it that's you that makes it stand out from like everything else and i think a lot of people they just think Anyone can hop in and do it. Yeah, you can. Anyone can start. Not everyone can succeed. Yes, not everybody's going to have the <clears throat> drive or fortitude to to succeed. Not everybody's going to want to sit there and record every week and put in the work that you need to do to be successful in this. And people need to understand that part of it. And I don't think if you're a millionaire, you're not going to necessarily have that drive all the time. Yeah, there's exceptions to the rule, but. And everybody's going to have the drive to do what we do. Yeah. I mean, dude, like, and I, I, you know this better than anyone else. Like, when you're sitting and you're recording a podcast, a two hour, three hour podcast, a lot of people think, oh, you're just sitting and talking. That's exhausting. Yeah. Then you got to edit it. Yeah. <laughs> God. Well, for those, those podcasters who do edit, but yeah. Then you got to edit it and clean the sound up, you know? Yeah. That takes time. Yep. So people don't realize that um, you do a, let's say you do an hour of podcasting. Then you got to do probably an hour of editing. Mm -hmm. Then you got to upload the podcast to the podcast server. Mm -hmm. Then you got to promote the podcast. Yep. Then you got to check the numbers. So for those who check numbers, you got to check the numbers and say, okay, this worked or maybe it didn't work and adjust from there. Maybe you need to promote more. Maybe you need to promote less. Maybe you need to see what you need to do to make it hit better. And like I said, there's a lot of things that come into podcasting in terms that people don't think about. That's straight up business acumen. Yeah, they, they just, and, and a lot of people just don't get it. Like, I think two, three weeks ago, I did, uh, I did four podcasts back-to-back -back recording. And they were each two to three hours long. And I still streamed and I still had a deadline to put out a review for a game. And like, I did all this on a Saturday. So when the Sunday came around, I wasn't doing shit. I turned my phone off. I was just lazy. And like, some people like were trying to hit me up. And then when they, they called me during the week, they're like, man, how come you just went ghost on Saturday and Sunday? I'm like, because I worked on Saturday and then Sunday is my day at rest. Like, this is, they're like, oh, all you're doing is talking. Well, not really. Not really. And then you got to add the fact that sometimes things don't go your way <laughs> when you're recording. You may have technical issues you got to figure out. You got to have, may have things go wrong. Anything can happen with it. So, man, just. Yeah, man. Like, um, do, do you have like a uh, mixer interface for your, when you're recording? No, I just use, um, Google Hangouts. I also have programs that I use to mix the podcast. Like I use, um, let me look at real quick. See what's going on. Yeah. Asset Music is one of my use and Audacity. There you go. Asset Music. Yeah, it's very, it's a very cheap program that I like. I used to use it when I used to do hip hop music. I used to make beats and stuff with. It. What I, what I like about Asset Music is when you record, like I use it to um, 
help mix the podcast down a little bit. Mm -hmm. Edit. What I like about it is it takes the files and puts them in the little blocks. Oh, it's made by Magics. Yes. It puts the files in little blocks. And let's say there's a, a piece of dead air you want to take out. You go to the little block, click it, dead air is gone. It's just it. It makes it so simple to edit. So usually where it will probably take an hour or two to edit something, a podcast, something like that, it takes me 15, 20 minutes. Well, now. It's not expensive. Okay. I think I need to play with that. Yeah. I need I need to get that. Because I, I use Audacity. Um, I was at one point using um, what's the thing on, app, on Ma uh, Max? I can't think of the name of it right now. I think Audacity is good for Quick compressing edit. and stuff like that. Yeah, But editing is a bitch because you have to Go to the file and you have to make it bigger. You have to find the clip. You have to cut the clip. You have to file it, put it together so it matches. It's so much easier to do that. Way more easy to do it. Yeah. I um okay, Logic Pro. That's what I was using okay. for the longest. But the thing is, the problem for me is all oh, that's on my MacBook, but my desktop is PC. So yeah. I've literally shifted my workflow over to just PC and like, you know, like when it came to video editing, I was using, uh, what is it? Uh, Final Cut Pro for the longest. That was my video editor. And now I've shifted over to using Adobe Premiere. And a lot of people are like, oh, that's so, so hard. I'm like, man, I find Premiere can be pretty simple sometimes. But um, there's this one app on a Mac that makes it so easy to just like if I'm doing a podcast like if someone doesn't want to use Hangouts a lot of especially a lot of the voice actors do not want to use Hangouts um you know, yeah and I'm trying to find a way how do I capture the audio on PC but I found it like apparently I can do it with uh you know the, the Logitech cameras yes. they, they got um logic capture and it just pulls you and your audio at the same time well, that's cool i have a lot of set camera i like i didn't even know like i started messing around with that you know how like i do the like when i upload my my podcast on youtube i got the background i got me i got the person like yes, before exactly. i was recording it using i had my laptop i had one of my extra cameras i have my main camera and i do it like that but the way it is now, my setup, my workflow is so much simpler because I can record. Like right now, I'm recording you with uh, Google Hangouts. I got it focused on you. I got my Logic Tech camera set up to record through Logic Capture. And it's also not only capturing me, you know, with video, but it also is capturing my mic and it's capturing the audio coming from you. That's great. All in one. And it's free software. And I'm like, no one, I, I I stumbled upon this. Like, I didn't even know it did this. And I have a lot of tech camera. I didn't look into that. I'm like, man, that would make it so much easier to capture. But, like, as far as, like, anything else, like a, a an audio capturing device for Skype, I don't know. Like, I know people talk about how you can use Discord to do podcasts. Man, Discord sometimes to me seems complicated. Yeah, it does. It's supposed to be simplifying it from what I've heard, but it's still like, ugh. It's I, I, try, I, I try not to even deal with it because, like, sometimes, like, I, I've had people like, yeah, I'm gonna just, you know, just let's do a Discord call. I'm, like, trying to figure out how am I going to capture that call because, I don't know, like, it's, to me, it's just su super complicated for no reason. Yeah. But um, as far as podcasting, I know, you know, we touched on it earlier about recording ahead of time. Like me, I, and I learned I, I learned this from you, too. So, again, you can get royalties off of this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I learned it from you to record weeks and 
weeks ahead of time. So, yeah. like, I always keep a stock of at least six to seven, maybe eight episodes ready. And then I've gotten to this point, okay, Monday morning, 8 o'clock New York time, boom, podcast is up. You can catch it on YouTube, podcast and outlets. It's on Twitch because apparently Twitch is good for podcasting now. I didn't even know that. Yeah, it's, it's becoming a thing. It's like, whoa. But, yeah, I, I learned that from you. And it's like I've had some people, I've had some guests that are like, oh, when's my episode coming out? I'm like, it's going to be a couple weeks from now. I'm like, can you push it out now? I'm like, no, I have a schedule. <laughs> <laughs> unless you yeah. want to pay for my Patreon and you can join and get it free. No. Yeah, I try to, I tell them straight about I recorded it weeks in advance. So I'll let you know when it's coming out. If there's anything that you want, to like have synergy with it in terms of like you got something coming out that time you want to come out that week, let me know so I can set that up. But for the most part, it's coming out when it comes out in the bad order because mm -hmm. you can you can balance out how you want it to come out in certain ways and who you want it to come out. And sometimes I'm looking like this episode is good, this one's really good. Let me get this one first, this one next. Kind of get a good groove to it. It's dope to have it that way. It's dope to have a whole bunch of episodes where you can pick and choose which one comes out. I always look at it like um, how you look at a TV show. Mm -hmm. Like something like Seinfeld or something. Like look at how you do a TV show in terms of I always get my set time for each episode and I kind of build out how I want it to go. So when they come out, you can say, see a kind of thread to it. And like, okay, I see what he's building to. Like this episode is good. I like this one a little better. Oh, I like laughing better. Oh, oh, this is dope. This is dope. You got to kind of build on it. Mm -hmm. And when you have multiple episodes already recorded, you can kind of pick and choose which ones you want to put out and where. And even if you get to the point, because I think it happens to everybody. We have episodes like, it's good, but this isn't my favorite one out yeah. of the ones I have. You can kind of like put, put it out. I you put this out between two really good ones. So it doesn't. So it doesn't fall victim of people saying, "Ah, uh, I wasn't feeling that one." Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I got one of those coming up. Uh, well, at the time of recording, it's probably going to come out in like three weeks from now, and it's it's with a YouTuber. He's got a lot of energy, like in his videos. So I'm expecting that same energy when we were recording. And that dude had, he was dead. He was dead. I had to carry that conversation. That's the other thing people don't understand. What makes podcasting tiring is sometimes you got to carry a conversation. Yeah, that can be rough sometimes. I've had oh. episodes where, and this is, I'm, I'm going to tell this story. I, I, I told them about it. I've had, I had a group of podcasters on, and they listen to the show. But they have, I guess, it's like it was recording with them was like herding cats. <laughs> because they kept going from, I'm trying to do the intro and stuff like that. They asked me a thousand more questions. They're like, hey, that's a cool background. Like, yo, can we finish recording, get into the intro first? They'll ask me a thousand and one questions while the podcast is going on. So I'm keep, keep having to ring them in. You know, let's get to this first before we get to these questions. No, 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 but I like your background. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about that. I get it. <laughs> Let's get to A, B, and C first before we get to this. And then after I finish report with them, they're like, man, we were all over the place. And yeah, you were. And you're going to have moments where you have guests who are going to be all over the place because they're is it so excited or just have quirky personalities. You have to kind of learn how to deal with that and yeah. move around it. Yeah. You can never go into... Uh, a podcast with someone expecting it to be a certain way because people have this tendency they can be a certain way you see them on camera or you see them on social media or in person but then when it comes to recording they can be entirely different and you got to learn how to just roll with it and that's one of the things i've learned like i for the most part i don't i like i don't come up with questions or anything i just hit record and go but I also make it a point, like some people I know could possibly be a certain way, like they may be that uh, Q&A, like 
for instance, when I interviewed um, Richard Epcar, he's a very Q and A type of person. You know, not really flowing outside of whatever I'm questioning. So I'm like, okay, so I need to stick to a, a, a format. But for most part, a lot of people they just you talk to them and go, they'll go. Some people I can't get to shut up. All right, all right, okay. <laughs> Like, okay, you're just gonna talk. I'm just gonna let you talk. Go ahead. Go. Yeah. Yeah, I do it. Let them talk. Close <laughs> out. <laughs> oh man. I, and that's the other thing like I want to ask you about when it comes to like uh branding your podcast. I've noticed like I, I had this one guy, he told me, he told me that he thinks that I shouldn't put like when I interview people. I shouldn't put the focus of the podcast on my guests, but putting it on me and them being on my show is like the additive. I disagree with it from a marketing standpoint, because I feel like if I put the emphasis on them and then a little hint that they're on my show, people are going to be like, well, what is this show? It's the mystery. I don't know. What do you think? I agree. I've always been the one who tells people that, um, Delvin Cox experience is not about Delvin Cox. It's about my experience with people. Yeah. So when I interview people, it's them telling their story. People are not necessarily coming in to see me. They're coming mm-hmm. in to hear individual stories that make them unique. But at the same time, because of my character, people gravitate towards me because I come off as the everyday man. Mm-hmm. I come off as a normal person asking somebody you want to talk to questions that you probably wouldn't want to ask me. Yeah. And it's important to be that. And if you're, it's almost like pro wrestling. Yeah. In terms of how the heels are only there to put the face, the baby face over. So sometimes you gotta knock the baby face across the head to get him to boo you a little bit. Mm-hmm. But the whole emphasis of it is to get the baby face over. So if you're a good heel. You're okay with that. And sometimes you gotta not necessarily be a heel, but you have to make sure you're getting the baby face or your guests over. Because mm-hmm. when you get your guests over, you're getting yourself over as well. Yeah, that's true. It's really true. And people don't think about it like that. People wanna a lot of people want the whole focus to be on them and have that ego. But if you're running a guest orientated show, you should focus on that guest. And make that guest feel comfortable to want to come back to your show. Yes. Yes. And one of the things, like another thing, God, like you, you, you're like my senpai, my teacher, right? <laughs> podcasting. Dude, one of the other things I learned from you, and I started implementing this in my podcast for the last year, is I always, like at the end of my podcast, the last question I asked him is, Did you have a good time? And I've never, I've never had anyone say they didn't. And they always, like, the, the thing I always get is, man, I can't wait to come back on the show. And it, yeah. it's it's so funny, especially when it comes to, like, the voice actors and the game industry people. I will make sure they have a good time. And then, like, I can be talking to, like, like okay, so, like, the, the guy I just interviewed um, for Tiny Metal, I didn't know how close he was to the creator of Final Fantasy. They're like best friends. Well, that's cool. And the guy who created Final Fantasy lives down the street from my house. That's even more cooler. <laughs> right? So like, you know, when I, I put up that podcast this morning, and then, you know, I got a follow from the creator of, uh, of Final Fantasy, the guy who's done the theme the music for Final Fantasy, like all the way up until like I want to say like ten, and a lot of other people in the game industry following me on Twitter or DMing me, and I'm like, "Yo, you never know." Yeah, trust me, I know. <laughs> I have some crazy people following me that I never thought I would have following me. I think it's dope, like um Scott Snyder. Great really? comic book. Artist. He follows me, yeah. He started following me after I interviewed uh, Rodney Barnes. A lot of people started following me after I interviewed Rodney Barnes. For those who don't know Rodney Barnes, 
was a writer on the Boondocks comic book series. He also wrote, not the comic book series, cartoon series. Mm-hmm. He also wrote the Falcon comic book, not too long ago, the Lando Coliseum comic book, that everybody loves, Double or Nothing. He also writes for American Gods TV show. Nice. He writes for Marvel's Runaway, Runaways. And he's going to be writing for, he's already written it now, it's going to be debuting in another couple of months, the Wu Tang series for Hulu. Which looks really good. Yeah, he was on the podcast. Love the guy to death, man. Great guy. I talk to him all the time now. And that opened my that opened my podcast up to a whole different audience of people, man. It's been great. I've had um him on. I talked I've actually opened the door for other people to have him on their podcast as well. Um, I've had on people like Jay Sandlin. Who's a great good guy. Great, great guy. guy. I've had on James Gabsey, who does the podcast Who Would Win. I've had on a lot of people who are big guys who do a lot of stuff in the entertainment business and they've opened doors for me to have on so many other people. And it's yeah. dope that it's happening that way because the people, when I first got the podcast game, I never thought that I would have such a, not only such a big audience, but such a pe- uh, audience that communicates and talks to me on such a regular basis like I think it's cool mm-hmm. and it's even got to the point now where not sounding me conceited or anything like that but I've had opportunities to talk to on, on Twitter to some of the people I highly respect like Kevin Smith mm-hmm. I've had conversations with Kevin Smith over Twitter multiple times and that's dope you know that's what podcasting got me because he's what one of the people who inspired me to start podcasts because he gave the speech about all the time on his own podcast about, hey, you want to get into this podcast thing, just do it. Just go out there and do it. Just don't matter. Just start recording and getting into the game. It's not that hard. And that always stuck with me. Kevin Smith was one of the first guys I know who was doing podcasting, like from the beginning. And to hear him say that, it's inspiring because he's made a whole empire out of it. I, I want to say that people... As much as we love those 90s movies, people know him just as much for his podcasting and him kind of being who he is now as they do for anything else. Mm-hmm. Like when you think of the podcasters, the biggest podcast in the game, people think of Adam Carolla, Joe Rogan, then Kevin Smith. So cool. It definitely is. Freaking. Awesome, man. And that, that's the thing. Like, you just never know what doors get open doing podcasting. You never know. No, you don't. <laughs> I got a funny question to ask you. Go ahead. Fire Emblem. Have you played it yet? No. It's the story behind it. I was I hear the story. So Amazon was supposed to Amazon was supposed to send my my copy because I got the uh the, the collectors. They were supposed okay. to send they're supposed to send it to me. I was supposed to get it by Tuesday. I'm not getting it until tomorrow. That sucks. And that then, sucks. then I also find out because I started looking through. I was like, wait, does it come with the season pass? Because you know, in the eShop, which Nintendo, y'all need to fix that shit. It's not horrible. It is completely horrible. Um, There's a I, lot of junk wear in there. Dude, it, it reminds me of the Wii. Remember all that bullshit that was on the Wii? Yes, it does. Exactly. <laughs> There's a lot of games that are 99 cent that shouldn't be worth 99 cent. And not at all. And it's like, so I, I, I went and I looked. I said, wait, there's a season pass. I went and checked it out. And the season pass comes all this other extra stuff, you know, extra scenarios, characters, weapons, and whatnot. So I was like, all right, let me go back and look and see if the collector's edition comes with it. Collector's Edition does not come with the season pass. That sucks. That really sucks. I'm like, why are they selling these games with no... Like, Why are you going to sell a Collector's Edition with no season pass? It makes no sense. None. At all. But I've heard nothing but good stuff about the new one. Uh, I'm a fan of the franchise. Um, I've played almost all of them except the Japanese exclusive ones. Um, but I, I'm excited to play it. I actually just went ahead and just bought the digital copy because I'm like, I'm tired of waiting. <laughs> this is my first Fire Emblem game. 
never played before. But I've heard so many people talking about it so much. Right. I said, I'm going to try it. I, you like I it? want to stand by it. I like it. I'm like an hour in, I want to say. Mm-hmm. It's really good. If you like that one, I think another good one, if they ever re-release it or if you just go ahead and emulate it, is uh, uh, Path of Radiance and the sequel, Radiant Dawn. They are... I, I, I'm i against people buying it on Amazon and eBay because if you look up Path of Radiance right now on Amazon, it's going for over 300 Jesus. If you get... Radiant Dawn, that's over a hundred. That's a lot. And it's what system is it for? GameCube and Wii. Oh, Wii Toledo. I'm about to just figure out other ways to play that. Yeah, I that I, I have no issue with emulation. I tell people emulation is like the library of gaming because it allows you to experience games you probably wouldn't have never had the opportunity to. I agree. So Especially now. Yeah. I can understand people being a little iffy about playing games that are for sale, like newer games, like that are just coming out. But games that are old, like that on we that on we and dead systems per se, I have no problem with it whatsoever. None. None. I'm because not. they're just gonna get lost in the ether. <clears throat> yeah. There's some games like um what was that game that came out on Sega CD uh, from the Metal Gear guy, Snatcher? Snatcher I which I love. I, you know what? I've never played it. I need to get around to playing it because everyone keeps telling me it's fucking amazing. I love it. I had, a, I had a Sega CD. When I was younger, I got a Sega CD at a yard sale for like 20 bucks. Holy yeah. shit. Man. But yeah, oh, I mean, what other ways are to play Snatcher? There's no other ways to play it, I don't think, if I remember correctly. And that's the sad thing about it, because there's so many. And the thing that even sucks about it, what I just thought about it, the fact that it's Konami. So they may not never re-release it. They're starting to re-release stuff now, but I don't know if Snatch is going to be high on their list of things they want to re-release. Man, I can say a lot about Konami right now. Yeah. Although, I do think Konami is on. They're prepping for a comeback. The reason I, I think so, that, yeah, I agree with that. I think that. You know, I, the reason I say that is because one, you got the Netflix Castlevania show, which is awesome. Which that kind of came out of nowhere and did really well. I don't think anyone expected it to do well. Yeah. That did good, and then you had the Belmonts and uh, Smash Brothers, which that was unexpected. And then you had, uh, I mean, minus Metal Gear Survive, which honestly, Metal Gear Survive is not a bad game. It's not. I think it's just a, probably was a rushed game. Yeah. That would feel like. Yeah, it, it feels like it was an ex, it was just an expansion on five, to me. Yes. But you know, I, I played it. They sent me a copy of it, and I remember playing it. And I'm like, this isn't a bad game. Like, story is forgettable, but. The gameplay is pretty good, but then you got all the bigger... Man, I could go into a rant about bigger YouTubers because I feel like they, in gaming and in tech, I feel like they can kill or give life to something. Oh, I totally agree with that. Um, perfect example of that is um, Days Gone. Yeah. Days Gone is a great game that it's got like, so much flack. I love that game. Such a good game. I don't understand why they hate it, but they killed it. They killed it off. Yeah. I think that game could have been a lot bigger than what it was. You know, they, they, Sony said it did good. It's going to most likely get a sequel. It could have mm-hmm. been bigger than what it was, but it got so much negative press when it came out that from YouTubers, from reviewers, that you know, it almost killed the game. But it got to the point where people just start listening to other people on the internet and say, hey, no, this game is good. This game is really good and started to pick up traction from that because like I said, I played it, I love it. Yeah. You know, and I, I saw a lot of people do the videos on it, like a lot of YouTubers say it's generic, it's boring, it's uninspired. And I'm like, the fuck do you think The Last of Us is? It's the same damn thing. Yeah, it's very similar. 
Yeah. It's very hard to do these post-apocalyptic zombie apocalypse worlds and make it so it's not dread. Yeah. Unless you're doing something like um what's the name of the game? Dead Island or something like that's that's kind of cheesy. Mm-hmm. But when you when you do such a serious take on like The Last of Us or Days Gone for that matter, it's very hard to make a game that is compelling in that type of way. I think Days Gone is a season that. Yeah. I enjoy the story of that very much. Yeah. It's uh it's a game I think that's unnecessarily bashed. And I feel like it's gonna be one of those games that when people come back around to it, they're gonna be like, Oh, it wasn't that bad. After Yeah, like the Detroit Become Human. Detroit Become Human got the same thing. Yep. People were bashing on it because they didn't like David Cage. And now people are playing it. They say this game is actually really good. Because it's a phenomenal game that a lot of people slept on. Yep. You know, there's a game that I think got overhyped, and that's God of War. That is really good. I like God of War a lot. I think it got overhyped because people wasn't expecting it from God of War. Okay. I'll see why I don't like it as much. Like, it's good. I'm... Like, after coming off God of War 2 and 3, I was expecting that level of visceral carnage. I can understand that. Two two completely different games. It's a 180. Yeah. The new God of War, it's weird to say, it feels more slower paced. Yeah. And the fact that you can't jump. (laughs) Yeah. It's more of a narrative story game. I like narrative story-based games, but like I said, it's not... If you like the original God of War game, this is not it. This is yeah. something completely different. And I can understand why somebody would, who liked those games like, nah, I don't like this one that much. It's good, but it's not what I was looking for in a God of War game. Yeah. And I wouldn't even go as far as to say they probably should have released Ascension on PS4. Yeah. It's around true. that time, say, hey, you got this God of War. That's the new reboot. Here's one that you may have not played. Ascension was good and people didn't play it. Yeah, a lot of people didn't play it. So why not just remake it and put it on the system? Ascension or the uh, or do a collection with the uh, PSP games. Yep. And just re-release it because I think that people would, would have grabbed, like for those who didn't like God of War because it changed its direction so much, that would have probably satiated those fans. Definitely would have. I mean, and you, you think about other franchises that were popular around the same time, like Devil May Cry. Like, Devil May Cry 5, they really didn't change the formula. They, the only thing they changed was the graphics. And they, yeah, made, they made the story more emotional. But the gameplay is still as insane as it's always been. And I was shocked yeah. because I I don't know how you feel about DMC Devil May Cry. I didn't mind that one. I actually liked it. I didn't that. either. I didn't either. I didn't mind it at all either. I think people made such a big deal about it because it, it looked different, but I thought it was fine. Yeah, I, I thought the story, like I was I enjoyed the story, I enjoyed the voice acting, I enjoyed the take on Dante. But so many people were like, well, it's the worst thing ever, it's the worst game. This isn't Dante, and I'm like I feel like that, which which is funny, because when you think back in the the late 2000s and early 2010s, all the companies were rebooting everything because, yeah. you know, people were not buying the games that were traditionally Japanese. They wanted Western oh. takes on stuff. You look at, there's a game a lot of people don't even remember but Bionic Commando got rebooted in 2009. Yes. And I loved that game, and people hated it when it came out. Yeah, they hated it. That game really a lot. I remember the reboot. I thought I think that you have to do that sometimes. I think you have to, um, like uh, Castlevania's reboot. Ooh, I thought that was excellent. I love Lord of the Shadows. Lord of the Shadows, very good game. I think they should have stuck with it, Honor. Yeah. I thought it was really good. Yeah, I, don't like change. 
I, I thought, especially like if they, here's how I think they should have did it. I, well, I like Mirror Fade and I like the second one. I don't like them anywhere near as good as the first one because the first one, when you find out at the end that he became Dracula and it skipped so far ahead in the future, I was thinking what they could have did is they could have left that to be the end of the series and just yeah. built a whole new timeline leading up to that point. Yes, I agree. And I would have loved it because the lore, the, the graphics, the voice acting, the music, I just felt like Lords of Shadow was such a market stand, like just, just improvement over what they had previously been doing. And yeah. all people say, oh, it's a God of War clone. Is that a bad thing? <laughs> Especially if it's a good God of War clone. Right? Because you remember when think, Dante's Inferno came out? That wasn't that great. Yeah. yeah. I think they could have, like you said, I think they could have built up to it where it got to the point where you're literally playing Castlevania 1. Yeah. An open world Castlevania 1. Where you have to go basically kill the character you've been playing with for so long. Mm-hmm. That would have been cool. Yeah. It really would have been. You know, and it's it's a shame that they didn't get to do more with it. Because I feel like in playing Castlevania Lords of Shadow 2, it felt rushed. Yeah. You know, even with the, the extra DLC, it just felt like they were rushed to get through and finish mm -hmm. it. Because the tone, it, it felt all over the place. Like, honestly, when I played it the first time, I could not keep up with what was actually going on. Yeah, because they... Kind of just rushed the plot through, and I don't know. Something was going on weird with Capcom at that time. Yeah. With Konami, with all those companies at that time, Konami, Capcom was going through, like, Japanese developers in general at that time was just going through something weird where, because I remember people were complaining about the Resident Evil games, too, at that time. Mm-hmm. Yep. They, did, they hated and five, and they hated six. Yeah. And now we're starting to finally get back where those companies are starting to get back in everybody's good graces. Like Capcom's having a resurgence. It seems like Konami's getting back into the fold of things where it's becoming where it needs to be at. And I, I love it. Yeah. I, I want to see the more gaming companies that do good, the better it is for gaming. I even like the fact that um, THQ Nordic is putting out so much stuff. I like that yeah. they're buying a whole bunch of dead franchises. Hey, remember this franchise, we're going to bring it back. That's cool. Because there's a certain, we need that middle tier, tier of games to play because it's always more things for us to do that way. I think I like that um, they brought back Darksiders, gave yeah. us a sequel of Darksiders that people wasn't expecting, and they gave us more Darksiders games. And I think they got a whole bunch of stuff to do. I think they're doing um, it's a lot of stuff they announced they're doing. Yeah, Destroy All Humans, I'm correct. Yep, Destroy All Humans, uh, was it two? Yeah. Or there's a whole new one that. That's coming out. Um, they're bringing. They're gonna do another Saints Row, which is so funny because I remember when Saints Row first came out. That was a GTA clone, and they went a whole set. different direction. <laughs> Man. It's good that we are getting that diversity in gaming again. I like the fact that because there was a time where we had so many different types of games to play. Mm -hmm. I feel like now it's gotten to that point where we just get you get your shooter, uh -huh. you get your survival horror game, you get your open world game, you get your game that's like Overwatch, and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. We definitely do. And, and and now you got all these people trying to hop on the battle royale style of game, and I'm like I don't know about you, man. I can't get into Fortnite. Me neither. My kids like it, but I can't get into Fortnite at all. Not my, not my thing. Yeah, you know, and no disrespect to anyone that likes it. If y'all like it, that's cool. But, I mean, you got to understand, like, the, the era that Delvin and I come from, you had a lot of choice, and damn near everything was good. Yeah. <laughs> and my problem with Fortnite is it takes up so much time from other games. Like yeah. Fortnite doesn't have necessarily a story mode in terms of like you play it, get to the middle, and get to the end of it, and you're done with it. 
Yeah. But that is a constant, ever going thing that you have to keep playing every day. And that's fine if you don't have no games to play and you, or you have some downtime. But if you're trying to really play some games, like, for example, Fire Emblem, yep. if I want to get through Fire Emblem or get through Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3, I can't sit there and play Fortnite for four hours a day or all day because those are other games that have story modes that I want to get through and I want to be invested in their stories. Yep. And even then, Marvel Ultimate Alliance, that was another surprise to come out. That game is good. I love it. <laughs> I absolutely love it. I get my team together and go bang up things. And I like the fact that it's, the cast is so diverse. Yeah. And yeah. it's almost like I was joking with people about it the other day about how they literally bring up the characters like they're Smash Brothers characters. Yeah, they do. Like you're, you'll be playing and then they'll just say in big splash letters, Venom has joined the alliance. I'm like, holy crap. That's how you know Nintendo has an influence over it, too. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. Oh, man. Like, you know, that's one of the things, too. Like, when I when I interviewed that uh, the Japanese developer, uh, Urasan, the other day, because I, I asked him offline and online about how, you know, Japanese gaming, it seems like that they're going back to what they used to do. They're focusing on what they're specializing in instead of trying to give her, like, give this or cater just to the Western audience. Because it's clearly different. The Japanese audience or the Asian audience and the Western audience, way different. Way and different. He, was, he was saying that, you know, the way it is now they have learned that they just need to focus on themselves. You know, can we sell to our market here? Because when they were trying to do Western style games, it doesn't sell in, you know, in Japan and it doesn't do well, you know, in Asia in general. And then they're not able to really, cause they try to keep a lot of, you know, the story based things that they do in Japanese games and they try to do it in a Western take. And it's kind of a hit or miss. And like I was saying to him, I'm like, I just like when you guys put out a product that you enjoy making because it gives me choice. Like, maybe I don't want to play a typical shooter. Maybe I don't want to play, you know, a PUBG or a Fortnite. Maybe I don't want to play a Fallout type game. Maybe I just want to play a game with a good narrative that's just going to take me where I want to go. Yeah, and you like guys that. are, yeah, and you guys are really good at making that. Very good at it. Like the Yakuza games are a perfect example of that because their narratives are very good and they give you a story that you don't just get here. Mm -hmm. it, it's an open, it's an open world game. Yakuza is one of the few series that's open world. I don't mind playing every time they come out because they're it's so different than what we get here. Yeah, it doesn't feel natural. It feels like you're going to Japan. It's cool. Yeah, you get super immersed in the culture and the, the aesthetics of it. Another thing, too, is a lot of people don't, you know, and I look at Yakuza like this, you probably do, too. Yakuza is the natural evolution of, like, Streets of Rage and the Brawlers of yesteryear. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I agree. Even with the way how bad guys just come up to you randomly and just start attacking. Yeah. Yep. Hey man, I, I gotta ask you with this uh, AEW. You gotta get your thoughts on it, man. AEW, are you thinking they're gonna become legit competition for WWE? Do you think we're gonna have the, the wrestling wars again, or do you think it's just an alternative? I think they're gonna become a legit competition, WWE, but it's gonna be WWE's fault. Yeah, because the more WWE lacks with their product and the more they highlight AEW in a way that they're trying to make unintentional, but it becomes intentional. Like the whole thing where they ran a pay-per-view at the same time on their network as AEW is running their event. Well, yeah. they, think they're hurting w they, they, they think they're hurting AEW, but they're really helping AEW because they're bringing a light to, hey, this is our competition. Yeah. And I'm trying to think who said it. I want to say Tony Schiavone says it all the time. Mm -hmm. One of the things he said that he used to drive him crazy about WCW was that you don't you don't never want to mention the competition. If you're mentioning the competition, you're acknowledging the competition, 
you give it a life, you give it a breath. And he says one of the things, the biggest thing that he regrets is that Mick Foley call because once he made that Mick Foley call, which he was told to do, by the way, mm -hmm. everybody turned to Raw to see what was happening. Yep, I remember that. <laughs> so you can't really, the best thing for WWE to do if they want to stop AEW, which I like, I like AEW, I like WWE, is simply to put out a better quality product. That's it. No more, no less. Listen to the fans. Give the fans what they want. Put out quality product. Give us quality matches. Give us stuff that we want to see. Make us enjoy the product. Tell us stories that we want to hear. You know, lately, WWE has been dormant, and even the stories that they have that are good, it's not like they were building towards them. They just happened to follow them, like the Coffee Kings thing. Yeah. They didn't build towards that. They just happened to luck out and get into that, the Becky Lynch thing. They wasn't building towards Becky Lynch being the man. They kind of just lucked into it. And in many cases, they sabotaged it on their own. Yeah. And it probably sabotaged it with stupid things that they do. And it's almost like they are fighting against themselves to put out a quality product. I think that Paul Heyman and Eric Bischoff being in charge a SmackDown and Raw, respectively. I think that's a good thing. I hope that they get let their voices be heard. And I think them putting the fresh coat of paint on it will help WWE in so many ways. Yeah. I agree. But, but on the AEW side, I think AEW is doing something that's amazing because they're giving you characters that people didn't know and they're making big names out of them. Perfect example is Cody Rhodes. Yeah. When Cody Rhodes was in WWE, he was a mid-card guy at best. Who people, his ceiling was Intercontinental Kid Champion, if that. He left and made a huge name for himself. Well, he's basically one of the biggest stars of wrestling. And yeah. it's dope that he's done that. And I think that's something that WWE could have built on. And imagine they would have took the time to help develop and build Cody Rhodes to that level. Yeah. Yeah, and and that's the other thing too is like i don't think cody rose is a great wrestler but he's got a hell of a persona yes and i'm like he, the whole kiss the ring thing the suit and tie how he is like the sadistic egomaniacal i'm like that's a memorable character yes he's very good at being he reminds me of his dad yeah. Rose. yeah. His character is better than his in ring work, but he can work in the ring as well, really good. He's good enough to put on a quality match in the ring, but his promo skills and everything that he brings to the table puts it over the top. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely yeah. agree with that. Some wrestlers don't need to be the best ring technicians to get over. I want to say The Rock is an example of that. Stone Cold is an example of that. A lot of the moves that Stone Cold did was punches and kicks and stuff. And the stone, the stutter, but it's the way you portray yourself and the way you built that character up to get to that level. The Rock's special move was an elbow drop. <laughs> but the way he did it, like it made us want to see it every time. Yeah. Because the character was so compelling. And I think that's kind of what's missing from wrestling today. Yeah. Like, when you look at WWE, like, with Seth Rollins, Seth Rollins is a great wrestler, but he's a boring character. Yeah. He's more entertaining on Twitter than he is on the show. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and uh, even with uh, Roman Reigns, like, no disrespect to Roman Reigns, I liked him back in 2014 when he was getting an organic push. Yes. Before they were like, yo, he's the guy – we're going to run with because honestly what made me get sick of WWE was from the rings. They just, they shoved him constantly. And it's like at the expense of other people. Yeah. Is he That's crazy to think about because they had stars there at the time that they could have built up to be big stars. Like I think a Ryback. Right? Ryback had to look, whether you hate him or love him, Ryback had a look of a star. Yeah. He could have been a big force in WWE just on how he looked. But and he was good on the mic. He was good in the ring. 
They didn't do anything with him. I was, uh, you know, and I still am a big Ryback fan. And I'm like, he could have been something. And yes. they dropped the ball with him. And, then, you know, you, you think back to other, other stars that they've had, like with uh, when Bobby Lashley came in, I'm like, yeah. okay, it's go time. You know, we're about to get Lashley versus Lesnar. And they they did a lot of things when he came in. And I know the WWE crowd is, I, I like how Chris Van Lee says it. They're wrestling fans and there's a WWE fans entirely. Yeah. Like when he came in, I know that they the, the fans were kind of lukewarm on him. But I'm like, yo, this is huge. He could have been something. They were building Bobby up. Hell, he even beat uh, Reigns. Yeah. And then they just they cooled off on him. They don't know how to follow through. They don't know how to. They know how to get your attention, but they don't know how to follow through. And they did the same thing with Braun Strowman. Oh God! They brought him up to be this mega monster, awesome character. Then slowly but surely, they just start taking him down a peg, taking him down a peg, taking him down a peg to the point where people don't care. Yeah. He he could have been he could have been major, but they fed him to Roman Reigns. They kept doing that. They they keep. Mm-hmm. Feeding him to Roman Reigns and I, and and the whole thing with Kofi Kingston, like Kofi is a great wrestler, great guy, but I'm sorry, I don't see him as champ. I would rather see Bobby as champ. I think I like that he's champ of SmackDown. I think yeah. it works better there. Yeah, because SmackDown's history of champions thus far has been guys like AJ Styles. Yeah. The smaller guys. Well, smaller guys, with the exception of Jinder Mahal. They've been the guys, the smaller guys, the guys that WWE wants to use as like projects. Yeah. So I can understand him being the champion there. It makes more sense for him to be champion there as opposed to Raw. But Raw's, even though they don't say it, Raw's your main belt. Yeah. So I would like to see, like, if they're going to build on it, I would like to see Bobby Lashley get a shot. He should be getting a shot at WWE Championship. Yeah. But they have been building, building this character up, right? I think that that just goes to show you how behind the times WWE is because NXT does a great job of building up their characters mm-hmm. and telling those stories. I think you can tell who runs NXT, you can tell who runs WWE television. Yeah. And, and I was going to say this too, like, when, you know, speaking on Bobby Lashley, it's, it's not even really believable that he could beat Brock right now. No, it's not. Like he could such a bad job building him. He couldn't even beat Finn Balor. Yeah. And it's funny because they fed Finn to Brock at what Royal Rumble? Yeah. And then then they fed Finn to Bobby and Bobby Mm -hmm. lost to Finn at WrestleMania. And I'm like, I'm these guys got the same background. Same height, same weight, same look. Yeah. All, all they had to do when Bobby came in the beginning of last year, all they had to do, was it last year he came in or was it this year? Was it? It was before WrestleMania. So I want to say last year, October, yeah. November. Yeah. So well, he's been there for a while now. Yeah. All they had to do was – Tease him and Lesnar for a year. Build up to it. They've been perfect. Because that's what everybody wants to see. Even still, people still want to see Lesnar versus Lashley. That's been, what, over a decade? Like, how how long now? 15 years? (laughs) Yeah, they still haven't did anything with it. They should have been there something with it. I think that they're going to end up, if they don't start thinking about doing that, they're going to miss the boat on it. Nobody's yeah. going to care. Like, I've always wanted to see um, La- uh, Lesnar versus Batista. That would have been a good one. They didn't do it back then. They teased it at WrestleMania 30. Like, I think when, uh, when uh, Batista came back and he... Yeah, when he came back before the Royal Rumble, they teased it. But they didn't do anything with it. I'm like, that would have been good. I would have loved to, back in the day, have seen Batista versus Brock versus Goldberg 
at hell. Throw Bobby Lashley in there. That a big big man can draw. Yeah, because they have the look of a star. Yeah, especially the ones that WWE have. WWE's always been the ones who make the big men look larger than life. Yeah. What do you think of what they're doing with Samoa Joe? I'm actually sick of how they're treating him. It's terrible. It is horrible. They don't know how to use it. No. And this is going back to what I said before. They're going to keep doing stuff like this. People's contracts are going to come up eventually. They're going to jump ship, whether it's the Ring of Honor or AEW. At times like this, the last thing they need to do is get a big star that people care about and go into AEW. Yeah. Look at John Moxley. He left WWE yeah. and was kind of like a mid-card guy. Went to AEW. People love John Moxley now. He's a huge star. Yep. Yep. And it's just it's something they keep doing. They did that with Nakamura. It really, the Nakamura AJ Styles, that series was stupid. Yeah, they blew that big time. Especially. Because before AJ came in, what was it, 2016, him and Nakamura had a match in New Japan, which blew the roof off. Yeah. They made, they brought Nakamura down so far and made people not care about him. And even now, they, they brought him, they're bringing him back up, but it may be too late. I, I like Nakamura a lot, but he should have got that championship when he went for the championship when he won the Royal Rumble. Him and Asuka. Asuka should have got it. Um, yes. Another person, Rusev. I have no idea why they're doing what they're doing with Rusev. I don't know. Like I said, they're going to keep making these mistakes. You're going to get to the point where these guys are going to jump ship. And go to AEW and they're going to make AEW WCW. That big competition there. Crazy because the thing about AEW that makes it so promising is that they have money. Yeah. They have backing. It's not like these other companies like TNA or TNA is a perfect example. They don't have money to go get the big stars. Or they don't have enough financing to pull up to where they want to get at. They're struggling to survive. So it's different. Like people aren't trying to go to TNA and deal with all that stuff. And I love TNA, but it's not where it used to be at. No, it's really not. It's really not. And, you know, you, you look at TNA now, they're always on Twitch. Twitch is where you can watch their stuff, if not a pay-per-view. And that shows you how far they've fallen. Yeah. Sad. It, Sucks. It, it really does. Because there's a point where TNA, I'd rather watch that than WWE. Yeah, I agree. There was a time where TNA had all the stars. And funny that we say that because WWE has all TNA stars now. Hey, you look at Monday Night Raw, it's, that's TNA. Yeah. It is criminal what they've done with Bobby Roode. Oh, yeah. That's another guy who could have been a big star that they just put to the wayside. But that goes to, back to saying that WWE are just picking up people just to pick them up so nobody else gets them. Yeah. And they don't care for the detriment to that product, but at least you're not in this company now. Yeah. Very true, man. Very true. Um, this feud with uh, Kofi Kingston and Randy Orton, that promo that R Randy cut on Tuesday, you were there for that, right? Yes, I was. That was savage. That was good. <laughs> I, thought the whole, I think the whole thing is really good. I want to see what they do with it. I hope they, if I was the booking, I would have Randy Orton win at SummerSlam. And take the title off of him and have Kofi I'll chase it. Have Kofi chase it and end up giving it back. But I think it'd be really interesting to build up on that because you can have Randy Orton beat him and just say, see, everything I told you was right. Mm -hmm. And brag about it and talk crap about it. And have Kofi finally get it back from him. Because you, right now we have, well, we up to what this past week we had two baby face champions. Yeah. And that almost never works out to be good. Yeah. 
you have to have that kind of heel to help build up momentum for what you want to see. I think Randy, I think Randy Orton still has it in him, man. I think Randy Orton still is, depending on who he's wrestling with, he still can put on a quality match. And I think Coffee Kingston will give him just that. Yeah. You know, and, and he, I mean, he's still got the look of a champ. And yeah. he, is he 40 now or he's just 30? I think he's 39. Yeah, I think he's like 39 or something like that. I mean, I would like to see him. I, I, I want him to beat Kofi because I want him to go on to get the title. And I want it to be Kofi versus Randy because that's a built in story right there. Yeah, that's a good story. You know, and they can keep referencing like they did. They referenced back to what, 11 years ago. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, cool. Keep keep this going. This is a good story. And like the whole thing with um, on Raw. I don't think Rollins is going to get the belt back. He he did not take off the way they thought he would. No. I agree. I don't think he's getting the belt back. I think that. um. If I was them, I'd probably give the belt AJ Styles. Yeah. Yeah. Especially with the club back together. AJ Styles could be your face of Raw, which would be awesome. Dude, we got to talk about that. We got to talk about it. I, I didn't even tell you I'm getting AJ Styles on the podcast. Well, that's awesome. But aside from that, aside from that, I got to ask you, what do you think of the name and the look, the OC? I get what it. What is the OC stand for? The original club. Is that what it stands for? Yeah. The only club, the original club. The only club that matters. But the thing is, I feel like they could have, they could have, okay. If I was WWE, I thought the name, the club, was stupid. I didn't care for it. Yeah. Uh, the OC, I get it. I don't care about it. When I think OC, I think of the TV show. They even made a pun on Raw about, you know, Misha Barden from the TV show should come and join the the OC. <laughs> it, it's such a bad name. I'm thinking, wait, doesn't WWE have a good relation with New Japan Pro Wrestling? Yes, they do, actually. I'm well, like, maybe not. Do they? I don't know if they do now. Well, shoot, because Ring of Honor, I think New Japan and Ring of Honor's relationships over with now. I'm just thinking, like, you could have just called them the Bullet Club. They keep referencing each other on social media. Yeah, big time. You know, and, and, and that could have been a crossover. Make it so, like, they are the representation of the Bullet Club in WWE. Give them the shirt. You know, Vince, stop being cheap. Partner up with them and do that. Give us the Usos versus the Geo versus God. You know, it, and like you said, AJ Styles is the face of Raw. If anyone is the face, it's him. Yeah, he's the one who's been the most consistent in terms of people liking his character. Heel or face, he's good. Yeah. What do you think of um, – do you think they're going to have Finn Balor join? They should. They should. I don't think they are. The reason why I don't think they are is because they have them with the thing with the thing. Oh, yeah. It, I, I just think if you got Finn, AJ, Gallows, Anderson, they could run a rough shot. They should. I think they need more heel factions. Yeah. They definitely do. I want to, you know, and I really want to see Undisputed Era versus the club or the OC or whatever they call. That would be dope. That would be dope. That definitely would be dope. All right, man. Is there anything else? Uh, I, I don't have any other topics to talk about. <laughs> Not that I can think of, man. You've been going for a minute, which is great. Two two hours almost, man. Yeah. Um, 
Well, anything you want to leave the audience with, man? Check out the Devil Cox Experience, and more importantly, rate and review Cast Note for Cast, man. Help this brother get where he wants to get at. Support indie podcast. It's essential to us that you guys give your support and show us your love, man. We appreciate it. Definitely. And tell people where they can find you on social media. I'm on Twitter at Delvin underscore Cox. I'm on Instagram at the Delvin Cox Experience. And I think that's all I know. Follow <laughs> <laughs> get the podcast at Delvin Cox Experience on any podcast network. I'm the same way, man. Like when it comes to social media, I really feel like Instagram and Twitter are all that really matters. Like I, I Facebook, Facebook is dying. Facebook's not my thing. It's yeah. I'm I'm so over Facebook, and I I think I don't know if it's going to be around for another six seven years. Truthfully speaking, I, I think it will, but it won't be where the cool kids are. I'll just say that. Which is yeah. already getting like right now. It's gonna end up like MySpace. Yeah. <laughs> but all right. And uh with that being said, people, I'll leave links to all of Delvin's outlets down in the description below the podcast. Uh, you'll be able to catch this podcast here that we're doing now. It'll be available on youtube.com slash Mikel Casanova, twitch.tv slash Mikel Casanova, as well as on all podcast outlets. So Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, iHeartRadio, coming soon to Pandora Radio, and that's just about it. I can't think of anything else except from hungry. And I need, <laughs> Miami. I need some of that Miami good food. I feel you on that, man. But um, <laughs> yeah, with that being said, people, Delvin and I are wrapping up this podcast. We'll catch y'all in the next one. Peace. Hey, did you enjoy this episode of the Casanova Podcast? Well, I'm sure you did. And since you did and you're wondering where else you can find it, you can find it on every podcasting outlet. Yes, it includes Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Launchpad DM by Podcast One, and so much more. And the only thing I ask of you is if you truly enjoyed it, even if you didn't enjoy it, please leave a rating and tell us what you thought of it, what you liked, what you didn't like, and everything in between. And also, if you're looking for video formats of this podcast and many more, you'll be able to find them on youtube.com slash Mikhail Casanova, as well as on twitch.tv slash Mikhail Casanova, and new episodes every single Monday morning, 8 a.m., Eastern Standard Time. So, that being said, this is Mikhail Casanova, Hawaii's favorite YouTuber. I am signing out. You guys have a great one.